productive <laughs> scientists uh, in, in Academia Seneca and uh, in our program. And he is right now uh, joined, uh, hired by him. He will produce, uh, present the ideas of our uh, I, AI in ecological applications. We welcome you. Okay. And uh, lots of you, if you have questions, um, you know, you can either ask me in, in Mandarin or in English. Um, so today I'm going to talk about how I use uh, artificial um, intelligence and apply it to um, our ecological studies. So for, first I want to acknowledge that um, uh, the, the result I'm going to present is basically a co collaboration between uh, three parties. Uh, one is from uh, the information science lab. It is in also in Academia Sinica. and um, and also my group uh, in Biodiversity Research Center, and also the uh, endemic uh, species conservation and um, uh, research center. Uh, they help collect the specimen. <coughs> the first. Um, um, I want to give you an overview about why, sort of, why we are interested in using uh, artificial intelligence in study the the ecological question now. So, if you look at this book, um, um, talk about the the science paradigms. And when I when I first read it, actually, I'm kind of shocked that. It's saying that you know thousands of years ago, people humans start to use empirical studies uh, to describe the nature of phenomenon. And a hundred years ago, a few hundred years ago, uh, it start to have the theoretical branches. So, for example, you use calculus and mathematical equations um, to study things. Okay, and then um, uh, for a few decades, last few decades, is the computational branches. So basically, you can use uh, um, simulation <coughs> to study uh, complex systems. Okay, so before um, um, sort of by my experience in using this artificial intelligence, basically I use these three approaches. And you know, so the difference between the theoretical one is uh, you can use analytical model and to understand the relationship between. Uh, phenomena and use the model to generalize what you saw. And also you will use computational models so that you can simulate things. <coughs> um, oftentimes if it's too complicated, it's difficult to use uh, analytical models. But nowadays um, uh, it's a fast growing um, a field. It's uh, uh, called data exploration. Okay. Um, so it would <coughs> Um, you, you can also see my research. The way you ask a question now, nowadays, um, at least in these branches, are a bit different from our traditional scientific training. So, uh, in, in a simple way, um, many things now is actually data will tell you, you know, what they want to tell you. In other words, um, previously, mostly we, we want to ask the question and have a hypothesis and then test this hypothesis by either experiment or use theoretical models. But in this case, um, uh, data exploration, it become, in a way, it becomes more descriptive. Um, the, the part of exploring data become more and more important because we have um, more data now, apparently, and then we have better computational powers uh, to do these things. Okay, one thing that you could think about is, um, you know, what kind of uh, approaches you are using in your own research. And um, this is just a, a, a brief summary that uh, there are many different kinds of artificial intelligence uh, method. Uh, you probably cannot read it, but um, it generally you can put it as a classification clustering and dimensional reduction and regression. Okay, um, there are different ways of, of doing this, and um, if you search it, um, 
there are some guidelines like what kind of question you want to ask. What's your sample size? Okay, and then you can choose uh, different method approaches. So I've, um, um, originally I prepared a section about deep learning, like brief discussion, uh, introduction of deep learning. Um, but I decided to skip it. Um, so if you guys have um, are interested in that, <coughs> I'll sort of briefly do that. But um, I'm going to go to the, the main topic of today's uh, uh, talk. Is um, we study the macroecology on Mars, and um, uh, we are interested whether uh, you know environment will influence uh, their colorations. That's our main uh, focus of study. And. Uh, <coughs> Um, Mars actually is a very diverse taxa. Uh, 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 uh. Um, so butterfly and Mars actually are uh, uh, relate, um, so closely related taxa. Um, uh, we we currently we have about um, uh, four thousand species of Mars in Taiwan. Um, so that's a. Uh, uh, compared to birds, um, do you know how many species we have in Taiwan? Six hundred, four six hundred. Yeah, it's like um, you can, you know, some people say four hundred, five hundred, six hundred. I, I, I mean, I'm sure the number would increase, but it's <laughs> about you know, five hundred, six hundred. Yeah. But for the moth, um, currently already known to science is already uh, four thousand. Pretty sure it's going to increase a lot if more people study. So it presents uh, both a, a, a challenge, and, but also a, a huge, a very rich resources um, uh, for you to study the ecological phenomena uh, using Mars. Uh, by challenge, I mean if you have 4,000 species, more than 4,000 species, it's actually very difficult to identify which species um, you know you collect. You can collect lots of species in a very short period of time, but it's very difficult to identify them. Is it, is it like uh, the previous video we used to count them? Hmm? Is it like the previous video which we just showed to count like the, the different species? I mean the previous slide, slide the previous slide. Next yeah. slide. Yeah. We well, use oh, the middle the middle. The middle. The previous the previous slide. Previous slide. Previous slide. Yeah. Previous slide. yeah. So you you use this middle to Next count like, the different species? Um, no, no, no. It's um, okay. The long story short is, if, if you want to use automatic system to identify species, you you first you need to have a very large data set. Mm -hmm. Okay, and for example, um, you know, some people might tell you thirty pictures per species. Okay, so that means if you want to have four thousand, that's uh, that's basically lots of them. Yeah. <coughs> so it's it's um. You know, technically it's easy, but it's just, you know, like many questions you want to use deep learning or artificial intelligence. And ideally it's easy, but it's very difficult to collect data. Okay, um, so basically these are all done by my postdoc, Wu uh, Siwei. He is uh, one of the, you know, best um, uh, Mars uh, researcher in Taiwan, so he can actually, you know, identify these species quite, you know, quickly. Okay, <coughs> so basically, it has a very high species richness, and it's well established in higher, um, you know, classification. But the, that means well is relative term, okay, and um, and it's easy to. Um, because their um, phototactic behavior is easy to track them by the um, by the light trap. Um, so my postdoc Wu Siwei, he actually worked on uh, constructing these data set um, for a very long while. So he basically built a very um, good data set. Um, What's amazing about it is uh, it not only has very good ecological information, uh, but they also took um, you know very nice um, um, pictures on the specimen. They have a very uh, good quality data, and they have a, <coughs> actually have a site, 
uh, it's called, no, <laughs> I don't know how to say it, but it's a uh, Mars and Butterfly in Taiwan. Okay, but it's in, in currently only in Chinese version. So if you're interested, you know, um, you can go to this website and see what kind of uh, Mars, uh, what color and what elevation and stuff. It's a very rich open source data set. Um, so, you know, before you come to my lab, um, they're really just passionate about Mars. <laughs> so they want to, you know, let everyone know that these, um, uh, these beautiful species in Taiwan, so they build this uh, a website. And, and one day, um, one of my students, uh, he actually see the, um, just go, go to the website and check on you know, the elevational distribution and just the pictures about these Mars. <coughs> and he said, oh, it seems like it has some color patterns, um, now different patterns of colors uh, um, of these Mars in different elevation. So that's why you know, we sort of started uh, <coughs> to, um, to analyze in these images. Um, but one thing you could do is, um, you know, you just look at these pictures. Um, actually, it's, to me, it's very difficult um, to see any patterns. <laughs> That's actually um, a common problem before, um, before people using the, 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 the artificial intelligence to analyze images. It's, it's just very difficult. What's the feature of this image? It's very difficult to decide. Okay. You see, this is uh, summer and this is winter <laughs> and higher elevation. Uh, you know, if you feel like they look all the same, that's that's quite normal. So our um, sort of a naive question at the beginning is just. Uh, is there a, 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 a trend, you know, the, the coloration trend along the uh, elevations? So that's a sort of our simple question. So it sounds very descriptive. Um, in my lab, actually, we, um, you know, usually you, you won't just ask this kind of a descriptive question, like, you know, whether the color change along the elevation. Because uh, it's a uh, um, it's a uh, sort of a first step of uh, doing research. You have these uh, preliminary observation, okay? Um, and it requires lots of data. So uh, our data is actually um, um, uh, Dr. Wu Siwei and this uh, Endemic Species Research Institute. Uh, they have a long collaboration since two thousand six. They, they basically collect lots of the moss, and then um, it, it, you know it takes lots of time to um, make it uh, a, a beautiful specimen like this. Okay. Like um, remember, uh, we were doing um, the sample um, we collect in Taiwan. It took you probably five days to collect, for example, twenty thousand specimen. Okay. Uh, and then you will need more than a year to sort out these species and then and take pictures. So it's a really a, a very hard work. And luckily, um, there are many people in Taiwan they are interested in, in moss. So uh, they have this, now it's called, um, how do you say it? Civil uh, scientist. Citizen scientist. scientist. Sorry, yeah, yes. Citizen scientist. Citizen scientist. So, um, <coughs> so yeah, they have a Facebook group uh, and also the data set and have volunteers can help collect the, the data and take pictures. Uh, uh, sorry, most of the pictures are taken by Wu Siwei and uh, uh, the colleague in, um, in the Wu Si Zhen and Lin Xu Hong in uh, Endemic Species Research Center to ensure the quality. But the distribution of these species, um, lots of them um, actually, uh, you just, when you see a moss, even now you can do that, uh, you just take a picture and upload it to, um, to here. And then um, uh, their team will help you, will help to identify which species it is. 
So now already accumulate um, um, 20,000. I think it's more than 20,000 now. Basically, lots of the lots of the data. Okay, so it has a huge amount of data uh, about uh, the location of the species and also the season. So we can use that. And sorry, sorry, but you said that. 20,000 species, are they all different? Uh, sorry, uh, it's a um, record, 20,000 records. Right. So yeah, in Taiwan it's uh, uh, um, yeah, about 4,000 species in Taiwan. So yes, uh, in our data set it's the same, like some common species you will have like, you know, 100, 200 records, but rare species you have one, two, you know, um, uh, records. Okay, so the summary is uh, these, you see? Yeah, this is the right number, it's a 200,000 record. Okay, for the locations, mm -hmm. it's 200,000 record. And uh, uh, provided by you know, more than 2,000 uh, uh, team citizen volunteers. Okay. That was in Taiwan? Just in Taiwan. Ooh. I think uh, they built sort of uh, one of the best uh, data database so far in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, in in United Kingdom, they also have a they call some kind of backyard mass collection project. So it has been going for a long while. But uh, um, I think they they don't have this kind of nice open data set yet. Um, um, we are actually uh, planning to use it. They they already performed that for for a long uh, for a long while also. Is it kind of uh, people that do hiking stuff? Is that why there's good numbers? Are people are like hiking regularly and see them? Like uh, in Taiwan, yeah, it's um, some people, you know, it's like, yeah, they go hiking and camping and they took pictures, but <laughs> many of them are actually they just love insects. So oh, right. they would have lights and attract the, the insects right. and took photos. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, one trip, if you have one trip to the Central Mountain or one wolf, you can talk more than two, I, I think, like 200 species. Oh, 200. You can see lots of them. Mm -hmm. Very difficult to identify. So some haven't identified yet, previous. Only 60 Yeah, Yeah, only 50% um, um, has been identified. Yes, because um, one is, uh, as I said, not that many people can identify mm -hmm. uh, these, these many species. Mm -hmm. And the other is, uh, some species are extremely similar. You need to use a microscope to uh, dissect them, to see their uh, organs, mm -hmm. breeding organs, to de determine which species they are. So some of them is just, without the specimen, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, many of them, I think it's just, uh, I think my post bar don't have enough time to <laughs> do all this. <laughs> they have a team, but still. And to be honest, before this, before our analysis, um, um, you know, in addition to just show people that oh, we have a database and we have a diverse mass species in Taiwan, um, scientifically how to use it. It's actually quite challenging. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, that's one thing that we're happy we are able to do it. Um, okay, so so it's still accumulating. So it's, the process is like this: you see this face, uh, Facebook post. When you see a mouse, if you want to know which species it is, you just post it, and someone will reply their you know scientific name, okay, and um, and the location. And then if it goes to this database, so it's uh, uh, it's lots of work, but um, it turns out um, the data collection part uh, kind of quite nice. And they also have the you know in addition to this just um, um, sort of more um, how do you say non-standard way to collect the data. They also have a more standard way to use the live draft. Um, <coughs> Set up the trap and uh, you know in different places. In, uh, so it's a certain locality. Okay. 
so systematically you collect the, the data also. Okay, so it goes to uh, the, our uh, analysis. Um, <coughs> so now it almost become my habit to, uh, you know, <coughs> to trace that the question you're interested. Um, so the, what's the oldest literature? Sort of, uh, <laughs> you know, you can find that talking about the same, similar, asking similar questions. Um, before I read the, the Wallace, uh, if you know, it is basically uh, Darwin and Wallace, um, they both discover the theory of nature selection. Okay? <clears throat> um, so before I read this book, the common hypothesis about how uh, coloration vary in, um, sort of along the environmental gradient, there is only one hypothesis. It's called um, colorful tropic. Okay. And then this colorful tropic, you know, it's not really a hypothesis, but it's basically just saying that um, if you go to the literature here and there, some people said, oh, when you go to the tropic, the, the living organisms are so colorful. You know? <laughs> There's nothing quantitative, <clears throat> you know. And then, okay, some people describe that, oh, you see so many um, uh, colorful, uh, organism in tropics. So, and then uh, in the past 30 years, some studies start to test it whether you know tropical species are more colorful than the temperate species, or you know lower latitude species are more colorful than the uh, high latitude species. And it goes to a simple question: How do you define what's more colorful? Right? <laughs> that's that's actually a very challenging question. <laughs> Okay, and then um, um, intuitively, if you look at a mosque or a butterfly or a bird, okay, how will you do it? How can you quantify it's colorful or not? Okay, so people start to do various things. For example, the most common one is okay, I decide this is a color patch, this is a color patch. So you basically sort of artificially say, okay, here's the patch, there's the patch. So I analyze. The, the color pattern of these, basically, it's almost in, inevitable. It's artificially uh, defined region that um, the, the color pattern of these regions. Okay, and um, um, previous study actually found that they, they could not find any pattern of the coloration variation along the uh, latitudinal gradient. So the, the colorful tropic hypothesis actually basically it is uh, largely rejected okay. and then if you read uh, the Wallace um, I think you know when, when you think about it it's, it's written in uh, like 105, uh, 150 years ago <coughs> and uh, they actually already know a lot uh, about the natural world okay for example here um, he has a, a first few chapters all donated to what's the sort of the, the uh, causes of these uh, color uh, patterns in the natural world. Okay, so uh, and if you know, he is the guy. He actually spent um, the background information is uh, you know Darwin. His family is super rich. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he actually doesn't need to worry things about uh, making livings. Okay, so he after his trip and he just you know read books and you know <laughs> thinking things, um, do whatever he wants to do. But Wallace is um, actually he is uh, born in a very poor family. So in a way, the way he make living is he go to the tropics and collect lots of specimen. And in that time, the British probably still now, people like to have some, you know, exotic creatures, specimen in their home, okay? So he can actually uh, make a living by collecting uh, lots of these uh, beautiful organisms uh, uh, and then come back to sell it, okay? So he keep, basically he's like, he just keep collecting lots, lots of uh, organisms in, in the tropic region. 
So the book, uh, this book he wrote is actually, he said the nature history of tropic has never been um, studied on the spot with the full appreciation of what to observe in this matter. What to observe meaning that basically this chapter, these few chapters of what to observe in, in terms of coloration. Okay? The very ways in which the coloring and forms of animals serve for their protection, their um, strength is discussed is as a vegetable or mineral substance. Um, their wonderful mimicry of other beings uh, offer almost unwork and unhelpful in healthful field of discovery for biologists. And uh, if you're not familiar with this, this is uh, basically the sort of the dominant uh, hypothesis about the animal coloration. Uh, uh, mimic, uh, mean type, like these. Okay. Um, still, these are still the dominant uh, regions, sort of area of interest of studying color colorations. They said um, uh, lots of them basically haven't really studied, been studied under the light of nature selection. Okay. So he said, oh, okay. Um, so this will uh, surely throw much light on the law and condition which have uh, resulted in a wonderful variety of color, shape, and marking, which constitute one of the most pleasing characteristics of the animal world. But the imminent causes of uh, which it has uh, as well been uh, most difficult to explain. Okay. So basically it says that um, it's, it's very difficult to describe them and it's almost equally or more difficult to explain why you see these patterns. Um, so when I start to do this research, you would actually, it, it, it's actually um, quite easy to see why it's so difficult. Because these uh, images, these color patterns, it's just difficult to quantify. Okay? And uh, that's the reason, you know, I think the artificial intelligence actually um, can help us uh, to resolve these problems. Okay, I'll just give this. Uh, these, these slides tell, basically tells you it's extremely it's difficult to process these images. Mm -hmm. okay, so uh, what we are interested in is basically the, the box. Okay? But um, at that time, when they took pictures, um, of course, we we don't have like slightly clue that how we are going to analyze it. So they put these uh, grid colors, uh, papers, as a background. Okay, and it turns out, you know, the first thing you need to do is you want to have a uh, remove the background. So it's you know given that we have uh, like you know almost thirty thousand uh, images. Um, you know, artificially remove the background. You know, if you try, you can use Photoshop. You know, to do it. But you know, doing thirty thousands, uh, it's basically um, you know super time consuming. It's, it's close to um, anyway. It's very difficult. So we spend lots of time to um, uh, remove the background and. Um, and we can see it's actually quite challenging because for these, for example, the white one is very similar to the to the uh, background, and you know you need to use uh, uh, basically we use unsupervised math first because it, it's easy to do, and then um, um, one of the the researcher she has to like look at every picture at the end, spend like three days to do the final check. <coughs> Like this. So at the end, it actually, it, it turns out quite well that we can remove the background of, uh, nicely. Okay, and then um, um, based on sort of the the understand of the understanding of the species, uh, my postdoc guess that you know different parts of the the moss uh, needs to be separated because when when they um, perch. On the tree, or you know, in different habitats, uh, many species they only show their fore wing. Okay, their back wing is just you know, <coughs> hiding. Okay, so you can see these. Their color pattern actually, the the back wing are often different. 
I mean, not always, but in many cases are different from the following. So we think that if we throw the whole images, uh, it probably won't, um, won't be ideal and um, um, probably would uh, mess up our results. So we also uh, spend some time to uh, basically separate the different parts. OK. And then finally, we have the, the raw data ready. The, the next step is actually, how do we analyze it? And I can tell you the story is, um, 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 I'm a good friend with uh, Dr. Chen Sunwei, who is mm -hmm. an expert in artificial intelligence. <laughs> and, and he is basically promoting uh, uh, the artificial intelligence, not only in the, um, sort of the, the, the research, but also in industrial and, um, and applications. So, because um, our uh, his daughter and my son attend the same kindergarten, <laughs> okay, so we have lots of uh, time to chat with each other. For example, um, uh, my son visit uh, the, uh, their house. We were just you know <laughs> drinking and chatting. Okay, and then he said, okay, uh, what topic you can you know can AI help you uh, in your research? Um, Okay, at that time, I have basically two potentially very difficult stuff I want to, I want to um, do, but it's extremely difficult. One is the, the, bear, the beetle I studied, called bear beetle, their social behavior. So um, um, basically, now I still need to hire lots and lots of, of the students, um, uh, part-time workers, to help us uh, watch the video and analyze what they are doing. Okay? And I can tell you, one of my PhD students, actually he spent four years to analyze um, this video, you know, hundreds, uh, thousands of hours of videos. So, okay, that's the first thing that popped up in my mind, that you know, can you use the uh, AI to help us analyze this? <laughs> uh, he said, sure, we can try. Okay, and, and then he um, basically um, assigned like, two research assistants to help me doing that. And the other project is about the, the, the mass coloration. Okay, and then, you know, the difficult question is um, what question we want to ask. And I said, okay, we're interested in how these coloration patterns uh, change, you know, along the elevation of gradient. But, and then, how do we study? That, that's the part, actually, uh, it, it, um, I spent some time, I, I think after a while, uh, okay, at that time, he just tell me, we can try if we can use these pictures, uh, these, these data set, okay, to try to uh, see if we can use pictures to predict their elevation or distribution, okay. So at that time, to me, it's just sort of beyond my imagination. I sort of, uh, if, if you allow me, I, I actually don't believe it. Okay. Uh, I, I sort of think that, okay, I study ecological phenomena so for such a long while. Is it really possible you know, to just use a picture to predict their elevational distribution? But he said, okay, we can try. And, and my another thing is, okay, even we can predict that. You know, what's the usefulness of this? <coughs> anyway, uh, you know, when you collaborate with um, people in different fields, I think it's important to sort of, uh, yeah, open mind, uh, be, be open-minded and then see, you know, how things play out, okay? <laughs> so, um, and the first step is actually after we, we sort of uh, sort out the data and stuff and build a model, and then um, I think uh, we, the model's predictive ability, okay, basically uh, formally is R squared, the, the relationship between the you know, the predictive uh, uh, elevation or distribution and, and the actual elevation or distribution is uh, stay at 0.5 for a very long while. R squared equal to 0.5 for a long while. Meaning that, you know, you probably can explain 50% of the variation okay, uh, by this method. And, okay, and, and I told him R squared 0.5 in ecological research is already quite impressive. Um, 
but he doesn't believe it because uh, you know later days I know that if you do these kind of uh, uh, artificial intelligence prediction, you want to you know at least hit to uh, point nine, then you know that's a good one. Of course, if you check the the paper, then several published paper they don't you know point five point six they already publish it. Um, not not this distribution is more like a classification. <coughs> but anyway, he thinks that it's not enough. So we further refine, basically to clean the background. You now first make it like you know mm -hmm. much nicer, <laughs> and then um, and also uh, this is the, the part that if you're interested, uh, I can sort of briefly. Um, so one of the breakthrough in uh, in the um, uh, this image processing in in deep learning or artificial intelligence is a. Uh, 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 they already have a, um, a database called ImageNet, and it uh, contain. Uh, not sure it's two million or um, 0.2 million pictures. Okay, it's already have a huge uh, a data set, and then people use that data set already train a model. Okay, uh, that already have lots of different image features. So because of that um, that data set, lots of picture picture already in there. So you can use that to actually capture what you need to observe it, uh, uh, for both. Okay, and use that um, to basically to uh, it's called transfer learning because you already have some basis, and then uh, you can use the final sort of layers, several layers to predict uh, what you want to predict. Okay. Um, the, the result is like this. Um, at the end, is if we have the uh, use the old sample, the R squared now is a uh, point eight six. So this is the predicted uh, elevation. This is the actual uh, elevation of the species. Okay. And if you look at the species with only uh, ten pictures or more, okay, the R squared can go to point nine six. So if you think about it. Ten pictures actually is not that many. Okay, so um, if one species you can have ten pictures, no. uh, we can actually have a R square point uh, six uh, nine six. It's extremely high, but even if it's uh, less or equal to ten, it's lower by it's point eight four. Okay, so I think it's quite amazing. Basically, you can use this to predict many of the rare species distribution. So how many species is that? Is that ten, more than ten pictures? Um, I think I think it's uh, about a thousand, uh, a thousand and two hundred. Because in total we have about uh, twenty thousand in our analysis. So about yeah, about four hundred species. We only have one record. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. <coughs> The reviewer asked us the similar questions, so I just <laughs> I just go through this and we have the, the data. Um, yeah, and also if you look at here, uh, for the the mass species, they have a widely distributed species and narrowly distributed species. And because our model is sort of a, we train the model as a, use a species as a, as a unit, so I think it's intuitive to see that you know if a species they distributed very widely, then the predictive ability, I mean R squared is a bit lower, 0.86. But it's a narrowly distributed species, the R squared is uh, equal to 0.91. Okay, so it's, uh, it's, it's quite good if mm -hmm. it's more narrowly distributed species. And if it's widely distributed species, I think it's just we need more data. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we just need to collect more data in, in different elevations. I think this can certainly be improved. Okay, these are the uh, 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 7C map, or uh, you call it E map. As you can show that um, you know what features um, uh, in the few layers of our uh, artificial um, uh, intelligence model. I mean deep learning models. Okay, uh, you can see it's some of the spots. Okay, and here. You know, the one of the weaknesses um, when you use these deep learning models, um, you know, it can be, you can use it to predict like their distribution, but it's very difficult to know exactly 
what features they are used. Okay. Uh, but these can, for example, it, it's just like human eye. It's very difficult to say, okay, what what part is important? But because it's a, a, a complicated uh, 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 network model, okay, uh, eventually they can help you predict it. But um, what we did is not only this. Um, okay, so as I said, the, the model here is basically the basic feature of the images. And these uh, are the one we trended okay, for our purposes. So the, the each uh, the picture can use this uh, um, uh, feature vector um, to represent it. So we then analyze these feature vectors of the images. Um, uh, one thing quite um, to me, it's very amazing is that if you look at the elevational distribution okay, of these species, uh, the, you can view this as a color space. Okay? Uh, we basically do the um, uh, dimensional reduction. Uh, for these uh, 2048 um, uh, vector and downscale it, uh, uh, reduce its dimension to two dimensions. Uh, picture okay, and then this is the elevation of the species. A very clear feature you can show here. You can see here. Can you see what's the general pattern? Actually, this is the sort of a. They use different way to present it at the beginning, but we saw similar picture. That's the 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 time I feel like whoa, it's it's super exciting. Um, so what it shows here, this is the high elevational species, <coughs> and you know goes to lower ones. And a very apparent feature is that um, uh, at least I think it's interesting is uh, you see the color space uh, of the high elevational species are actually confined in a very small region, okay, very small area. That means um, the uh, sort of the color variations or whatever feature you know you see in the uh, our deep learning model is that uh, uh, high elevation species they look more similar than the low elevation species. Why? Um, it's just the in of R. If you look at here, this is the color space. Mm -hmm. okay. If you are a cluster together, that means you are more similar. Mm -hmm. But if you are sort of a more widely distributed, that means you are, you know, more different. Mm -hmm. So this is how this figure. It's like your, you know, PCA and this kind of a uh, uh, figure. What's it? You have equal number of species. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a good question. Uh, the reviewer also asked us the same question. <laughs> um, the thing is, uh, actually, at, at the beginning, we didn't analyze that way, analyze the result uh, this way. But anyway, I'll show you a more formal results in a minute. Um, but just look at this. You have more species in the, in the lower um, elevation. That's right. Yeah. So it's possible that it's because that there are more species yeah. So that you know they occupy a large um, uh, color space. So what's the A mean? B. Oh, these are the uh, uh, what's the A refers to? It's a different um, the species in basically in different uh, elevation. So A means the species we call it an assemblage, a, a species basically distributed from um, zero to a hundred. Okay, we use a hundred uh, meter as an interval. So this uh, uh, from so A B C D means that it's uh, from uh, low to high, okay. Mm -hmm. So these are the species number. Uh, sorry, it's too small, but um, um, it has different numbers. But uh, so this A B C D means that uh, it's uh, zero to one hundred, hundred to two hundred. You know, so it's increasing in their um, elevation uh, distributions. Sorry, what's the S Y S S means? Um, 
Yes, uh, it's um, it's like uh, you know PC one and PC two means um, uh, there. It's a high dimensional model. Uh, okay, the, the, then you so from collapse them in two dimension. So can can you help me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How do you explain PC? Uh, it's a, uh, PC one. Yeah. It's, so it's, I think the data was in two thousand fifteen. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Originally, it's the two thousand uh, oh, forty eight. Uh, 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 Dimension vector, oh, yeah. but because it's you know you, you cannot plot the yeah. yeah. picture for you know two thousand dimension, yeah. so we reduce it to two, uh, two dimension. Oh, yeah. So this is one axis, this is the other axis. Oh, yeah. um, uh, I actually have a slide on this. Uh, you know, you later later <laughs> here, the, the, but it's sort of technical, but. Okay. Anyway, um, it, it's like a combined factors uh, in, in this dimension. <clears throat> um, so this is just a, a sort of demonstration. So actually, later on, we analyze uh, use a more formal way. So this is uh, use a directly use the two thousand forty-eight um, um, dimension fact, uh, feature vectors to analyze their similarity. So it turns out, you know, quantitatively, uh, it's still in the lower elevation. You have a sort of higher color diversity and higher um, elevations. And um, uh, we also control the sample size effect by using the bootstrap method. So we just, um, you know, randomly select two, two species and and to compare their um, uh, color distance. Okay, so you can basically control the, the sample size effect. Okay, and then we want to know, um, so at this point, uh, we know that it's sort of like what, you know, a different version of uh, colorful tropics. I mean, it's, uh, what we show is uh, a lower elevation species. It's more sort of colorfully diverse. Um, uh, than the higher elevation species. And then we want to know why. It's uh, sort of the, you know, the habit we want to do, like when you see this pattern, can you uh, sort of uh, think of any reason can explain it. Uh, this is elevation, elevation. Um, Sorry, this index is um, it is an index about uh, within the sandwich uh, color variations. Okay, that means it's a different way to analyze it, but uh, a higher elevation, the variation within the assemblage is a assemblage property becomes lower, and then um, this is the similarity uh, between species. Okay, become more different in higher elevation. Uh, and it's largely driven by the temperature, uh, okay, but not by precipitation. Okay. If you plot the precipitation, you won't see the similar trend. So we can do a sort of a structural equation modeling to sort of infer what's the, the, the causes. So what we found is actually um, um, when you have a, a higher temperature, <coughs> okay, you will have a more bright color which leads to a high, higher uh, color variation. Okay. And the, the, the first relationship that actually many people already know is that in a cold, uh, colder environment, uh, the, the color of uh, the, the animals actually often are darker because it can help you absorb heat. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's one pattern that many people found um, that, so, what we did is actually we use this to explain why you see uh, less color rate variation in a uh, higher um, uh, elevation. So this hypothesis is actually um, uh, basically I propose this hypothesis, and um, um, the simple idea is uh, if 
I ask you to to draw a candy, you know, and in the higher elevation, in the cold environment, that means you can only use more the, the darker colors. Okay. So if you can only use darker colors to draw the pendants, then the color variation, I think, it's going to be less, right? In compared to if you can use uh, more bright colors and you can mix many bright colors, it becomes darker, right? So that means that uh, I think this is a constraint on the color var variation. Um, we actually can uh, you, you can mathematically prove that um, we actually have a proof that uh, <laughs> you know, mathematically uh, this would work. Uh, the dark color actually would actually uh, would result in less color variations. Um, okay, um, this is the last two slides. So. Um, one thing I want to say at the, at the end is actually, um, um, if you look at the history, um, there are several times that you know people study artificial intelligence, saying that it's the era of uh, artificial intelligence. But uh, actually, it failed in the last two times as two AI winter means that you know just probably like now, not not really like now. Not, nowadays, you heard you hear a lot of people saying, you know. Uh, what AI can do can do lots of things, but similar similar um, uh, argument has been made, you know, in fifties and eighties, but they are not successful. But nowadays, actually, um, in, in current days, um, uh, it's actually at least based on my experience, <coughs> I think it's um, it's really different from before because the computational power and also the uh, uh, data, you know, the, 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 the speed of data accumulation are much faster. So we can really, uh, you know, do a lot now. Um, so one thing probably uh, you can think, I mean, you know, whether you want to do AI or not, uh, you know, one thing you can think of is what that will impact your life and, you know, uh, impact your study. Actually for uh, many biologists, um, for example, people doing sequence, um, we all know that you know the AI is coming in. You know, it's going to replace some of the analysis you did. Then you know it's quite important that you, you would so prepare yourself to the part that you know the AI cannot replace you. <laughs> um, but also you know it, it it can really be applied to uh, many different areas. Okay, um, I think that's okay. Great. That's <laughs> he is so passionate, right? And so commitment to the biologists. <laughs> yeah, any questions? Please. Uh, hello, uh, I wonder if I'm making the specimen, we all, all often put the uh, dorsal side, dorsal side top, right? But uh, if we need, we use the AI to analyze the ventral side of the space will the uh, uh, result will be different or something? Yeah, I, I actually think it's going to be different because uh, even um, we use different parts uh, of the mass, uh, you know, it's different. Because uh, I think our best result actually is um, the color, the prediction part we use the, the whole species. But if we analyze their color pattern, Okay, we use the full wing and the body to um, and, and, and divide by the, 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 the whole color. Then you will see the pattern I, I said. I think it's largely because uh, many species, they expose their full wing and their, their back wing is hiding. Okay, so, so, so if you, you uh, we use, we, we want to analyze the butterfly, so uh, the twinase, uh take a break, their uh, wings will uh, fall, right? Uh, the, the for the butterfly, yeah, they will fall. So probably it's the different reason of uh, you know shaping their color pattern. So oh, here okay. we can what we can see is actually the thermal part is very important when they sort of, you know stay there. It's important for they can to absorb heat. So that's the reason I think we see the pattern. So uh, like your question, if you 
use the draw so I yeah I think it would be different. Yeah, it's likely it would be different. And, and another question is uh, when we analyze the color pattern, uh, we we uh, mostly use the visible lights or the UV yeah. lights. Yeah, we use visible light. Um, but but uh, like the visual of the insect, they maybe they are more uh, mm -hmm. concentrated on UV light, right? Yeah, it would be that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, you know, Rivera also asked this question. <laughs> um, um, you know, one thing, one thing. Um, I like this research is, uh, you know, I know nothing about coloration at the beginning. So when I presented uh, to one of my uh, previous students, uh, he is at Harvard. Uh, he said, okay, he is in a, a, a group study mass. So basically what they're interested in is in what they're, for example, predator, okay, other insects. You know, from the, you know, predator's point of view, so they have a different vision, okay, so they care, okay, uh, you need to use UV or, you know, to take pictures. Um, one thing is that we, we actually want to do that. We, we want to use UV light and we actually, um, you know, ask the company to build that for us. Uh, long story short, it's, uh, it's quite difficult at this stage to have a large scale UV images. Um, at least, you know, doing 30,000 will take uh, a long time. But um, on the other hand is, um, even we don't look at UV, you still can see these patterns. Okay, so I I'm, I think if we can use UV, that's sort of a add um, just I think would make it even better because um, yes, UV might be an important uh, 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 part of their selection. Okay, other questions? Please. When analyzing the photos, uh, do you calibrate the uh, the background or like? I mean, when, when you take the photo, like, there's a difference in the ground and the background and also the camera itself. How do you take into account the different brightness or like, yeah, yeah. contrast in the camera? And the yes, um, believe it or not, our reviewer also have this comments. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we actually uh, did calibrate. Um, so because we have these backgrounds, Okay, so we, we, we can adjust the, the image's background to the same property. Okay? And, but it turns out that uh, whether you calibrate it or not, uh, it doesn't really uh, influence our result. And I think the reason for this is um, uh, if you see our, our model, uh, because it's 2048 dimension, so I think some dimension already sort of take into account these mm -hmm. variations. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a very standard, you know, it, uh, yeah, standard question and important question when you analyze the images. There are actually several papers about how, how do you calibrate your <laughs> cameras and backgrounds. And um, one story is um, currently we only use the specimen. Uh, lower than 2,500 um, uh, meters in Taiwan because the specimen or higher elevation, they use different method to take it. Okay, different method, okay. different method to take pictures. Okay, and it's Why? just no reason. It's just these people using this, the other people using that, <laughs> and you know. But it's because it's so different. So now we are actually just redo all these photos, use a more standard method. So in other words, it's if the variation is like this, it's okay. But it's really too different. It's yeah, mm -hmm. it's difficult difficult to uh, adjust. Okay. Any other questions? Um, if you you said that there's some species that's very similar. <coughs> But look, uh, yeah. but even within the species, isn't there a slight variation between the different? Like, yes. Species? Does that does that throw off the AI when you? Yeah, that's a reviewer once first question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, next time I should just print that in here. <laughs> Address audience in the paper. Yeah, that's a very good one. And yes, uh, I think intra-specific variation. Um, uh, I I think it's 
our sort of uh, uh, next step. If we can accumulate you know, enough pictures for uh, sense species, you know, it, 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 it's like um, mm -hmm. if I have all Taiwanese uh, personal ID you know, in a standard way uh, with good lighting, and probably I can use that to predict where you were born. <laughs> That's sort of the idea. I think it's possible. But uh, it's just you need to have the data first, uh, the, the database first. So um, we don't have that yet. That's why we also uh, currently choose to predict the mean elevation of the species, not like each picture. It's, it's still not, uh, not possible yet. Uh, I wonder, uh, could the AI system uh, deal with uh, individual differences? Or, uh, because maybe the winds broke or some have <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, some problem. Yeah, uh, for example, um, sorry. Yeah, this, or, you know, some species, their male and female are different. <laughs> okay, so sexual dimorphism. And some species, they have you know, people say like like equal type. You know, if you're in higher elevation, it looks darker, and you know, so mm -hmm. there are individual variations. So um, we cannot <coughs> we cannot deal with that yet. It's um, I think it, as probably many people doing this kind of research would tell you, it's really just because we don't have enough data. Mm -hmm. So if we have enough uh, data. Uh, we can deal with this part, or we just separate them into different parts. This is female one and this female one, and different uh, elevation. Yeah, it's uh, one thing very funny when I sort of start at the early stage of working with them. Uh, I mean, these data scientists. They told me that you know when you do AI research, you need to have face <laughs> in AI. Okay. Uh, now what does that mean? You feel really stupid. Why, why do I need to have faith in doing research, you know, scientific research? Uh, at the end, um, I realized that uh, when, as I said, when the, for example, R squared, the predictive ability is 0.5, whether that's enough or good enough, whether that's the limit of, you know, these models, you know, if you believe it's not good enough, you would work more, right, to for example, troubleshooting and find out what's the uh, potential problem, then you can improve it. But um, when you do a research, you need to decide when you want to stop. That's another thing based on your face, right? If you think it's really likely, you would invest more. So I think the, my collaborator, he has a super strong base. So he, um, when, when our R squared stay in 0.5, He's, he just thinks that's not possible, so he invests more people, more power, <laughs> to do this, and it pulls up to 0.9. So, it, yeah, it pays out because if, if it's 0.5, probably it's difficult to publish it in good journals. So, which journal right now? Uh, it's in um, uh, Nature Communications. Uh, uh, I think it, it's it's in revision, but I think it will. Be, yeah, oh, that's good. Very good. Yeah. Other questions? So, so from 0.5 to 0.9 is the, the AI's trick in the AI algorithm that did that? Um, no, it's actually um, because of uh, image quality. So <clears throat> the, the story is um, uh, originally, as you can see, my collaborator, he collaborated with several people, many projects. So at the beginning, uh, the one who assigned to this is sort of not his best, you know, researcher. And then he said, ah, that's not possible. So he sent his best one. And then, uh, uh, and then he looked at the, the, the results and the pictures. And the, especially the salency map, the heat map. Many of the heat map at that time is not on the Mars body itself is in the peripheral area. So you think it's it must be the you know image processing uh, not good enough. So he spent some time to clean up all the backgrounds. Um, then 
just in a few weeks, you know, in two weeks, it's, it become much better. It's a really a miracle to me. <laughs> So I actually try others on so inside grayscale. We we use the max to just check the outside, right? Actually, that turned out quite well. I I don't know why, but you know it's also 0.5. So just the outer shape, you can have a point R squared equal to 0.5. So yeah, we don't know what's going on yet because uh, I'm I'm sure no one. You know, or no biologist would predict that only seeing the shape can predict their dis distribution so well. And, and also another question for this figure is that if I look at this figure, I would probably say from the low, le low elevation, high elevation is along the dimension two. Yes. And uh, the, uh, the right hand side of this low, low elevation uh, scatter part, it looks like uh, something happens over there. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so dimension one, dimension two. Yeah. 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 So yeah. any again any physical <laughs> any, anything like that? <laughs> you know, again it's indirectly. Um, okay. This this analysis actually is looking at two things. This is, this one is uh, is called environmental filtering. Means that each of these is a, a variation of an assemblage, means that uh, the species distrib distributed in the same region. Okay, that means when you go to the uh, higher elevation, okay, 
these assemblage become more similar. It's, so it's called environmental filter. Uh, the environment makes everyone look similar. But here, uh, it's called the internal filtering. Means that um, uh, in within assemblage condition, it's not just environment will influence their trait. The condition, mm -hmm. you know, uh, between the species, they will also influence your trait. So this means that if there are stronger internal mm -hmm. condition, every assemblage would look more similar. Okay, so it's these two forces. Okay, that means actually at the lower elevation, the competition within the assemblage uh, might be stronger. So, you know, they become more different. So I think that sort of um, sort of explain what you said. You know, because the within the assemblage competition is strong. Yeah. But what exactly contribute is within assemblage competition? You know. Uh, we don't have direct data, but the idea is like they compete for food. Or, you know, in lower elevation, there are different patches. You know, some species on the trunk, sugat, some on the breast, so some green, you know, some, even some are on the lichen. So they have different, very different uh, variety of colors. You can actually see that. But, um, you know, this is sort of the quant quantitatively show that. The difficulty is, can you, you know, use this more more directly show this relationship. That's still difficult. But yeah, I think something is sort of uh, yeah happens. Okay. It's already the color patterns. It's already Yeah, that's a good direction then. Yeah, no one asked this question before. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good direction. We, we will, yeah, I, we can think about it. Uh, but in our analysis, we do control for the size. We standardize every uh, picture, so remove the size effect. Um, but yeah, I think other traits, it's, uh, yeah, I think that's something probably we, we can look at whether there are other property of species can mm -hmm. can influence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So you started from the birth at the beginning, right? Twenty years ago. And then it's the barrier beetles. So my dam At the beginning is the Guan Hua Mei. Guan Yu Mei. And right now it's the the moss. How to move from this one to another one to another one? Um, it, it seems like become smaller. smaller. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Very beetle actually is smaller than most of the mouse. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, I think all of us are IPC students, so you can share without any trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I think um um. The answer is actually um, when I come back to Taiwan uh, to Academia Sinica, um, uh, I have a good freedom <laughs> of work on whatever I want to work, and also um, you know have some resources, and then uh, you know it's a long for me it's a, a, a learning process. Uh, at the beginning, when you build your own lab, everyone tells you you need to be focused, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Focus on this area, so mm -hmm. you know you can be famous, you can be productive. But um, honestly, um, uh, one fact I can tell you: many of my manuscript, actually, when I submit it and and you know in the revision stage, mm -hmm. I just give up. I don't revise this paper mm -hmm. and. Because I feel like it's boring, you know. <laughs> so that's actually a, the reason that if you look at my my publication, I don't have I, I don't really have that many publications. Mm -hmm. It's uh, you know, really uh, uh much much fewer than I hope. Oh, uh, but and then uh um, at some point I really doubt myself whether 
you know, I should just focus on, uh, 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 for example, the bird uh, uh, or the bear beetle. Um, it's really not the organism, it's the, the question you ask. Mm -hmm. But, and then, um, I feel like, just, just like this study, um, I, I think I'm at the stage that um, I feel like if you, if you want to catch something big, you know, you want to have a really huge net, <laughs> right? So, to me, I think I, I can sort of uh, tell you I feel like I have a huge net now. So, mm -hmm. um, so I'll let the small one go and catch the big ones. Mm -hmm. So work on different fields. It, it's also by building a huge net, that means I think you, know, you need to read various things. Various. But at some point, I feel like it, now it become together. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this research and my behaviors research or ecological research, it become actually quite similar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's sort of the honest <laughs> answer. <laughs> Any other questions? I mean, you can see that Dr. Sun is so committed, so passionate, and so creative as well, right? So creative as well, and so open-minded to the AI stuff. <laughs> Other questions? Do you, think, do you think you use AI methods more in the future? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, because it, you know, it turns out quite well. So I actually decided to build um, sort of an AI group in my lab. So um, <laughs> I actually hire, um, hire a person who graduated in um, uh, computer science. Um, and also I, yeah, but the bottom line is actually uh, when I see this, I think um, it, 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 it sort of opened a new area of research to me. Because, um, it's, it, see, I can use a picture to predict the distribution of organisms. And the most, one of the most difficult and challenging question in ecological research and conservation is actually the distribution of species. Mm -hmm. And many people try to develop a method, um, you know, not just use the, 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 um, sort of the occurrence data. Because currently the standard method is, okay, uh, you know the, the species distribute in this grid. And then you said, okay, what's the temperature What's the you know distance to ocean um, elevation and all these factor and you use more like a correlational method and to correlate the environmental factor with their occurrence. You know, 99% of the distribution model is done by this method. But what we found is actually you can use additional information, which is the picture, to help you have a high resolution predictions. For example, if you ask people doing distribution model, okay? The thing is, if in Taiwan, you want to predict the distribution of the bird, that's relatively easy, because lots of people are watching birds, and you have this e-bird, you know, you can upload the, <laughs> the location of the bird you see, and it's only, you know, five, six hundreds, so species, so you can have enough data for one species. But you see what we did here, 10 picture is enough. So, and our species is 2,000, okay? So that means this approach, I think it can revolutionize mm -hmm. the whole area of uh, species distribution. And what you can do with that, for example, if you have a conservation issue, you, you want to ask what climate change will influence, you know, the vulnerability of species, their distribution. I think we have the, potentially, we have a new and a very good method to, you know, tackle these questions. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, um, yeah, I'm actually, um, th this is like, you know, you, you see a really good opportunity. So, yeah, I'll, I'm currently invest more on this area. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I mean, this, this topic will be also be the IPCS <coughs> fellowship yes. award, right? So <laughs> if anyone who might be interested in or haven't uh, got your research idea or your thesis yet, Maybe you can join Professor uh, Sun's group, uh, and we have the more discussion maybe later. Okay. And any other further questions? So we say thank you to the professor. <laughs> and we will have the next IPCS faculty lectures in.
uh, face of the man, face of the man will be a bio uh, geologist. Uh, right now is the director of the, the geologist department, Wu Yimin, to give us the lectures about his research and then his ideas about how can do for the thesis. Okay, face of the man, face of the man. Thank you very much. <laughs>